Okay. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, there's a lot of ground I want to cover here, so I'm just going to jump right into this. Welcome to, yeah, well, that's just like your opinion, man. A somewhat in-depth look at the role of the critic in society. I say somewhat because I'm kind of pressed for time. So I'm just going to jump in a little bit about me real quick. Uh, my name is Martin Schneider. I'm an English and writing student here at Southern Oregon University. But more than that, I am part of a crew that writes film reviews for a long-standing uh, comedy and entertainment and pop culture website called somethingawful.com. That's me. I occasionally I do spots uh, on other sites. There I am again. Something Awful has been around for about 10 years. I've been writing for them for the past two. My grandfather, the man I'm named after, was a restaurant critic for a small newspaper in New York in the 70s and 80s. Criticism is part of me. It's what I do. It's in my blood. And I'm hoping by the end of this, I'll convince you all that it is in yours as well. So they say when you're supposed to do these things, you're supposed to start with a quote or a joke. And as I was writing this speech, I realized that despite the fact I write for a comedy site, I'm not actually funny. So I just went to, I'm going to go ahead and show you the first three quotes I pulled off Google about criticism. I love these. Having the critics praise you is like having the hangman say you've got a pretty neck. Eli Wallach, star of films like The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, and The Magnificent Seven. I love that. This is a good one. Critics! Those cutthroat bandits in the pass of fame. The poet Robert Burns. This is my favorite. Critics are like eunuchs in a harem. They know how it's done, they've seen it done every day, but they're unable to do it themselves. <coughs> that one hurt. Way to cut me deep, guy I had to Google. People hate critics, and yet for some reason we continually consult them. According to an independent survey done for MovieReviewIntelligence.com, 81% of moviegoers follow reviews before making some kind of choice at the theater, and that is only movies. By the way, this speech is going to focus heavily on literary and film criticism, because that's what I'm well versed in. I'm hoping it goes for all criticisms. If you're an inspired music critic, I'm very sorry, for many, many reasons. <coughs> Part of the reason people hate critics is because everyone's a critic. Everyone can do it. And you're supposed to. If all art, former SOU student and New York Times critic at large, Sam Anderson, made this argument. Life is criticism. The three basic steps of criticism are noticing, assessment, and reaction. And that is something that we as humans have been involved to do. We do it every day. You're doing it to me right now. You're noticing what I'm saying, assessing it, and reacting to it. Well, we're going to start, Michael Ryan starts his book uh, on an introduction to, learn, to criticism by pointing out that criticism is the analysis of human cultural life. What science does to physical life, criticism does to cultural life. It takes it apart and studies it and figures out why it works the way that it does. I realize I'm focusing really heavily on quotes right now, so here's something that I actually came up with. This is what I call the critical triangle. It's, it basically follows the relationship between artists and audience and critics. Ideally, a critic's job is to be an interpreter, a go-between between these two groups. If all art is part of, con if all art is part of culture, if all art is part of society, then it has context, it has themes or message, something more that something that reflects something else, that re represents something else, that has other information needed to enjoy that particular piece of art. Kanye West writes a song about Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift writes a song about Kanye West. You can listen to those songs individually and they will be good songs. But when someone steps forward and they reveal the stories behind them, the history, the dichotomy between these two people, it actually enhances the listening experience. And that's what positive, good criticism should be doing. It should be enhancing the audience's experience. Negative, good criticism, on the other hand, should be identifying what the artist was trying to do and explaining why it did or did not accomplish that. If a critic is doing nothing more than simply stating their opinion, they are doing it wrong. Now, of course, some audiences don't like to be informed. Recently, my site ran a negative review about the Avengers, and the backlash was incredible, including this quote right here, what is so scary about not thinking about a film? This is one of the messages we actually received about it. So basically, that's saying, what's so scary about not thinking about media that we consume? Soylent Green is people, people. <laughs> To me, that line of thinking is just as dangerous as saying, what's wrong with closing my eyes and just shoving things in my mouth? 
What's wrong with not paying attention to who I have sex with? That is the danger that we're looking at here, because we're not paying attention to what goes into our, into our brains, into our bodies. So there's a bit of a social responsibility of being a critic, and here's what I mean. Some of you may have seen this movie. I'm seeing some eyes rolling fantastic. It's a fairly, fairly ridiculous little children's film. However, I'm going to give you a, big, a little brief plot description of what happened in Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Beverly Hills Chihuahua is about a rich white dog who goes to Mexico. The instant she's in Mexico, she's kidnapped immediately, because that's what happens when rich white dogs go to Mexico, and then she's sold into slavery. She escapes, but she doesn't have her ID tag, so she has to hire a coyote to sneak her across the border. A literal coyote. I thought that was, was pretty clever. She is helped along the way by the George Lopez character, which is a little Mexican dog who, by the way, is her gardener. The little Mexican dog is the little rich white dog's gardener. That's not subtext. That is just text. <laughs> That's what happens. You don't need an English degree to know what's going on here, which is why I'm so glad I paid this institution thousands of dollars for mine. Now imagine being a Mexican father, taking your children to see this movie, after reading a, a review from, I don't know, Peter Travers, saying, great, a rollicking good time, without, <laughs> without noticing or reporting on any of this. Of course, some things, some films, some works, uh, lend themselves to interpretation a little bit better. You, know, you can write an entire essay about how Ferris Bueller's Day Off is actually about a little boy who has a imaginary friend, but it's going to confuse and off-put a lot of audiences. Which is why we get to the biggest backlash for against criticism. Critics are snobs. For some reason, we take our artwork very personally. And people seem to believe that a critique against a piece of art that I like is a judgment against me. And that's ridiculous. Unless we're on a date, in which case I am absolutely <laughs> judging you. <laughs> so, criticists aren't willing to give free passes to things because of what they are. If, because it's designed for children or because it has superheroes in it, we're going to give it a free pass. And that doesn't seem to make sense. So people like to argue that critics only like highbrow things, movies like The King's Speech, and they don't like simple comedies like Dumb and Dumber, which I will tell you right now is a lie. Everyone <laughs> loves that movie. <clears throat> the thing is, there are rules. Crit criticism is a game of comparison, and comparison only works if you're talking about two similar things. No one is going to judge a rap album for the same reasons they judge a country album. No one's going to judge red wine because it fails to be white. And no one should compare movies to hamburgers. It's just ridiculous. How am I doing on time? Four minutes. Okay. The problem, is, the problem that we face now is, and I realize the hypocrisy of me saying this, with the advent of the internet, a lot of people have a lot of time to say these things. And everything that I just said requires the critic to have done their homework, to have a little bit of background and establish these guidelines. And the more you know about your chosen subject, obviously, the more you know about the rules. Sites like Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic have condensed everything down to simplistic blurbs. Everyone can, people can look at a, at a tomato meter score and say, this received 70%. Critics liked it. It must be objectively good. Art is subjective, and we have rules in place to make it objective when we're making these judgments. Because of things like this, and again, I realize hypocrisy would be saying this because, fingers crossed, I'll be on this at the end of the summer. Um, because of that, people are willing to just condense everything and their entire thought and feelings on a piece of work into some kind of a blurb, some kind of sentence that is desperate to get on the cover of a book or a movie. This is Peter Travis of Rolling Stone. He's very bad about that. Terrifically exciting. Hold on tight. It's a true call of the wild. I saw that this week. That is for The, uh, the Grey with Liam Neeson. The problem we, have, we face with critics as critics, is that we can talk about, we can criticize things all we want, but it doesn't stop things from being a hit. <laughs> we can criticize this book all we want, and we do and we should, <coughs> but that hasn't stopped it from making billions of dollars. And it's not going to stop people from standing in line to see the movie. So what's the point? Well, negative criticism is fun to read. It's fun to write. It's, it's 
it's still an art form in its, in its own right. However, rather than trying to get people not to purchase the bad, what we should be doing is championing for the good. In the film Ratatouille, there's an antagonist who is a critic. He's a food critic. And he's one of the only decent portrayals of a critic in film. And he's got this little line right here at the end. I want to show a clip, but I didn't think I have time. There are times when a critic truly risks something, and that is in the discovery and the defense of the new. The world is often unkind to new talent, new creations. The new needs friends. And that is for the purpose of a critic. To convince you that there's something else worth looking at. Bob Dylan, Kevin Smith, there are, there are tons of artists and examples who would, would not have careers without a uh, critic pointing out and saying, you should pay attention to this person. There's some talent there. Folks, I believe truly that criticism is an art form. It is just as much artistic as the pieces that it, uh, it analyzes. It's personal, it's creative. Whether you believe that your body was given to you by some form of God or through billions of years of evolution, there's one thing that's for sure. This ability of the human brain to notice and analyze and react, that is a beautiful gift. And why should we have it if we're not going to use it? So that's the true purpose of a critic in society, ladies and gentlemen. In a world where people are trying their hardest not to think about things, someone's got to be the one that leaves their brain turned on. Thank you.